Welcome and good morning to my talk, State of the Union Android Security Overview. I'm Matthias Lange. I'm a PhD at the Okay, I'm a PhD at the Technical University here in Berlin, and I'm yeah doing security research, uh, usually the level below Android, so on the kernel and uh, OS level. Um, but I had to deal a lot of uh, with Android uh, during my work, uh, so I want to give you um, an overview uh, what I my insights from that. So, yeah, the question is why should you care about Android security? So at least uh, that you're here shows that you are somehow interested in the topic. And um, yeah, so let's set up the motivation for that a little bit. And <clears throat> maybe you can give me a short hand uh, on how many of you already experienced malware on their own devices, Android devices. Are there any? Okay, at least I saw one, two, three. So yeah, that's that's more as uh, I usually get. So um, you're really honest about that. And so yeah, um, let's first have a look uh, on the mobile OS market share of 2012. And it shows that Android devices um, are making up uh, the majority of um, yeah mobile iOS market share. So it's more than two thirds. Then following, followed by iOS with 17%. So it usually depends on how you count, but um, that's yeah, the number you're getting. And then we have the smaller ones like Blackberry, Windows, and also still Symbian is around. And yeah, please keep that number of 68% in mind for a couple of slides. Um, I will come back to that. If we look back like three years from now um, and see how the malware distribution was in 2010, we see that the majority of malware experienced in the wild, if you want to say so, uh, was targeting Symbian. Um, at that time, Nokia was still yeah, very fortunate in the smartphone market with its Symbian OS. But still, uh, you can see uh, Android accounts for roughly 12% of the malware total. So total were um, 80 different samples of malware experienced. But this already changed one year later. So Android caught up two-thirds of the malware of uh, roughly 200 um, in total uh, account for the Android uh, for Android and still Simeon is very strong so it's usually an indicator that there are some security weaknesses in the system yeah and last year um, the malware share of Android overtook the share or the market share of Android itself so it shows that Android has become very popular and it also became very popular popular for the bad guys. So there is some business opportunity there for the bad guys. And uh, yeah, it's also the other way around, uh, like we heard in the morning from Professor Randenberg. Um, here is Android in the lead, but it's not a good lead. Uh, as you can see, iOS malware roughly is yeah, below 1%. So the question is, why is this so? So why are there so many, or why are there so many malware for um, Android, and why is it so popular for um, attackers? So first, a short disclaimer: um, this talk uh, will be not a deep dive into Android security. It's out of um, yeah. It will just basically blow the time slot here. So usually I give this overview in a t one or two day workshop. So um, yeah, I had to change it to a more or less high level overview like flying 100 miles above uh, sea level. And for the talk, I picked three special topics I want to talk about, which are yeah, fairly new to Android, so they have been introduced more or less within the last 12 months. So they are quite interesting. And yeah, if you want to know more about Android security or a special topic, then just hit me after the talk and we can talk about it and I'm happy to share my knowledge with you. 
so what's on the agenda for today? Um, yeah, first of all, I want to start with secure boot because that's the foundation of security or for device security. Then still a popular class of yeah, threats to any software system are memory corruption bugs. So what's Android doing about that? And of course, um, there have been some improvements uh, about application security on Android and I will talk about that as well. At the fourth point, uh, I want to talk about um, Android security problems. So what are, from my perspective, um, severe problems in the Android ecosystem which are causing these high popularity for malware uh, on Android. And that is an outlook at the end, uh, we will see what we can expect from the future. So maybe also already this year or next year. So, secure boot. Yeah, secure or trusted or restricted boot is fundamental to the platform security. So if you cannot judge on the software stack you're booting, or you cannot authenticate the software stack you're booting, you basically can boot anything and you can also boot malware. So um, you need to authenticate the software stack you're booting. And roughly the boot process on Android is five steps, or yeah, more or less on any embedded system, so this is not just Android specific. Um, so you start out with some initial bootloader, then you load with that initial bootloader, you load another bootloader which gives you more flexibility on uh, what you can do with the platform. This bootloader usually loads the kernel and then the kernel takes care of booting the first process on Android which is init and then init and Android um, just uh, reads in a configuration file and boots the rest of the system. So how does this boot architecture lo look uh, on the yeah, hardware level? So very, very low. So in the smartphones, there is a so-called system on a chip, which is a highly integrated um, CPU, which has some peripheral um, devices on the same chip. Uh, and I've put some here on the slide, so what you need is some DRAM controller so that you can access the memory on this system. Usually you have a security subsystem which is needed to um, do fast N and decryption because that's very compute intensive operations and if you have some specialized CPU core on the uh, chip you can really speed up that uh, process. And you also have some controllers for um, the various yeah, storage medias you can put into the device for NAND flash, for SD and MS MMC cards. Um, then there is eMMC and also USB uh, can be driven from those controllers. And you have a small area on the chip uh, which is called the ROM, this read-only memory. And there the manufacturer of the system on a chip stores is his initial bootloader and this initial bootloader is not software anymore but it's really burned into the silicon so you cannot change it later, cannot update it. I mean you can rip out the chip and play or put in a new chip but as, one, uh, as soon as this chip has been produced in the factory you cannot change um, the bootloader anymore. The bootloader usually um, also takes during manufacturing um, the so-called operating mode pin. Um, I sketched that here in the lower left corner, uh, which determines the initial boot media from where the bootloader should be loaded. So you can, for example, load the bootloader uh, from some flash device or from an MMC. That depends on the OEM of the device. So. <clears throat> the controller is connected to the boot device and on the boot device um, you find the bootloader. The bootloader has been signed, the signature has also been stored on the boot device and of course you need the kernel which is also signed and you put the signature there as well. So how does this authentication of the software stack works? So you have the image and you have the signature. Both parts are loaded from the boot device into the main memory. 
And then the bootloader uses the security subsystem to verify that signature. And it works like um, taking the image, uh, separating the signature from the image, um, hashing the image. Um, so that's here usually SHA-1 sum. And then you also take in parallel the signature. You check that ch signature with the public key. And then you compare both ha hashes against each other. And if they are equal, then you have the right boot image or the right kernel. And then you can load that kernel and start that kernel. It has already been loaded, sorry. But you can then be sure that this is the right kernel. And then you can start that kernel because you can trust that this is the one which has been verified by the OEM, for example. So the next part of the talk is about memory protection. Uh, as I said before, huge number of bugs or huge class of threats to any software system are memory corruption bugs like buffer overflows and stuff like that. And Android has a few mechanisms around um, to protect against those attacks or this class of bugs. So since Gingerbread 2.3, um, Android um, or the Linux kernel basically implements the so-called execute never bit. This is a bit which you can set in the page table um, from the um, physical to virtual memory mappings and say that data stored on this virtual memory page cannot be executed. So why is this useful? Uh, yeah, this is useful for example to mark the stack of a program as non-executable. Because if you have a buffer on the stack and you do not do boundary checks and the attacker is able to overflow that buffer on the stack and you can execute on the stack and he basically can just put in his shell code into the buffer and try starting to execute it on the stack and he has injected his code into the, uh, into the process. Another technique is the mmap min address. Um, so imagine an attacker which is able um, or who's able to memory map the first page of the virtual address space. So starting at address zero and then for example 4K. And then he knows that this is a Linux kernel and this particular Linux kernel on the system has a vulnerability in, the, in some kernel module. And he can trigger that vulnerability uh, in the kernel module, which at the end uh, causes a null pointer exception, which sets the program counter to zero. And now the attacker has mapped this first page in the system so he can put in his code onto the first page and then this code gets executed by the kernel. So he basically has um, subverted the kernel. And the way um, Linux pr uh, prohibits such an attack is that it sets uh, the so-called mmap min address. So usually that's 4K, so you cannot map the first page in the system and just avoids this kind of bug. Since Android 4.0, um, Google has implemented the so-called address space layout randomization. I will go into details uh, about that on the next slides. Um, but unfortunately, uh, with Android Ice Cream Sandwich, they forgot to do it properly. So, but they took the opportunity to do it right with Jelly Bean, uh, which was introduced uh, in late 2011. And with also Jelly Bean, they introduced the position independent code. We will see on the next slide why this is important. Uh, and another technique they introduced is the so called read only relocation. And that's a technique um, that when you have a code which is loading dynamic libraries, then usually the symbols in those libraries are. Yeah, sol uh, dissolved lazily. So when you call a function which is located in a library, then usually uh, the linker kicks in and resolves the symbol, um, which gives an attacker the opportunity to um, hook into that process and replace a particular function call with his own code. And uh, so he can, yeah, 
reroute function calls and by doing the symbol resolving during loadup, um, you can avoid that and marking the resolved symbols as read only, the attacker cannot modify them anymore. So what is address space layout randomization? So basically it's a technique to randomize the location of memory mappings in a process or in, within an address space. And you use that for uh, randomizing the location of the stack, of the heap, of the libraries, of the dynamically loaded libraries, of course, and also uh, of the exec executable. So why is that yeah, important or why do you need that? If you have an attacker and the attacker is able to somehow gain control within your program, then when he knows um, that at specific memory locations he can expect certain code snippets, then he is able to use those code snippets to program his own code. So he does not need to end, uh, he does not need no longer to inject shell code, but he can take existing code snippets within your address space and uh, yeah, do whatever he wants. And research has shown that the code snippets you, for example, can find in the libc are Turing, Turing complete, so you can basically do anything. <clears throat> this address space layout randomization is basically or mainly provided by the Linux kernel. Of course, it needs support in the user land to properly function. And when you combine that technique together with the non-executable you get a fairly strong system because this makes it for an attacker probabilistically hard to yeah, gain control of your program. As I mentioned before, this address space layout randomization has evolved over, the, over time. Um, so there have been first steps, or the first step has been done in gingerbread. So what I did here is that um, I looked at the memory map uh, uh, of the Vold process. And so you can see that uh, the first two lines, um, there is the binary code uh, loaded into memory. Then uh, I picked uh, the libc, uh, which is a shared library here. And you can also see uh, the linker and the stack and the heap location. So. Then I killed the process and Android then transparently restarts that process. And uh, so then I took a look again onto the memory map and you can see uh, that just the location of the stack is different from before. So everything else is the same, the memory location. So just the stack location is randomized. So the situation improves uh, within Ice Cream Sandwich. So again, I took the Voldy binary, looked at the memory map, killed it, and there you can see that the stack is still randomized. And also the location of uh, the shared libraries are randomized now. But still the linker and the binary itself are not randomized. And the reason why the binary is still at the same address is that it's not position independent code. So the loader, when the Waldi is loaded by the loader um, to start, um, cannot freely place it uh, within the virtual address space, but it has to load it at fix, fixed addresses. So finally, uh, in Jelly Bean, Google did it right. Uh, so they implemented all the pieces that were missing in Ice Cream Sandwich. And um, because I couldn't get the hand onto a rooted Jelly Bean device, um, I took this time sleep uh, with a value of 1,000 seconds. Uh, and you can see that um, the binary, which is System Bin Toolbox here in that case, um, and also the stack and the linker and the dynamic libraries, all those locations are um, randomized. Please do not wonder why there is no heap, uh, but for sleep you do not need the heap, so there is no heap allocated for that process here. The last piece I want to present here uh, uh, um, of this security overview is the application security. 
So um, I don't want to talk about the permission system of Android because it has been around a long time. Um, if you want to know details, um, you can ask me, uh, but um, usually this is a topic on its own and uh, yeah, judges its own talk here. But um, instead I want to focus on two key pieces which have been evolved uh, during the last 12 months. And the first one is called Bouncer. Um, so yeah, Bouncer is basically a malware scanner which uh, has been implemented by Google uh, when you op upload an application to the, to the market. So um, the app gets executed in some sort of emulator. And um, the problem with that, uh, first um, maybe, why you need that. So um, in the past um, there have been a lot of attacks using the so-called app repackaging. So what the attacker did is he downloaded a popular app from the marketplace, um, decompiled it, um, injected his own malware, repackaged it and for example, uploaded it on a, a slightly different name. So you can imagine, for example, an Angry Birds DroidCon edition, uh, which usually doesn't look too bad. So a couple of users downloaded those apps, uh, which then in turn uh, Google made repeatedly pull apps from the App Store. And so they decided, okay, um, to avoid that kind of attack uh, or to mitigate that kind of attack, um, we scan now the apps when they are uploaded to the marketplace and try to find whether there are some common malware inside. And um, so they can yeah, provide, prevent that kind of attack. Um, the downside of that is that the detection of the emulator is fairly easy. So one security researcher, uh, Charlie Miller, um, they uploaded an app to the marketplace and um, they ran some detection routines within that app. And what they did is they detected that they were run inside the emulator and then they opened a reverse shell to their own computer so they could uh, talk to the emulator. Um, then they notified Google about that problem and apparently Google has fixed that, uh, but it was a funny, well, funny story. Then with Jelly Bean 4.2, uh, uh, Google improved that bouncer uh, service because um, not all users are using the standard Play Store, but they're using alternative uh, marketplaces. And um, to prevent the user from downloading or from uh, installing malware from those places, um, they have a local version of the bouncer installed uh, or inside Jelly Bean. Uh, which now scans also apps from uh, alternative marketplaces and it should, in theory, prevent the installation of a uh, huge number of um, malware. Another feature which has also been introduced uh, with Jelly Bean is the application encryption. Um, this, was, uh, or this was a feature introduced by Google um, to protect paid apps because uh, what you can do is when you have a rooted device, you can just pull an APK from the device and install it at some, on some other device, uh, which maybe is part, uh, why, or part of the reason why um, the revenue on Android is, isn't that big uh, as on iOS. Um, so they introduced that so that you cannot pull the um, encrypted application from uh, the device and install it on some other device. So each app, when downloaded from the app, uh, app store, will be encrypted with a device-specific key. But um, when they rolled out that feature, um, they, the developers or some developers uh, had some problems with the apps, uh, usually uh, credentials and also uh, in-app purchases were gone after rebooting the device, so there was a problem. And for the time being, Google um, shut down that feature in the first place, um, so it's, it's, it's expected to yeah, come back within the next version of Android, but nobody knows when that will be. So what are some main security problems within Android? And from my personal view, these are missing updates. So when there is a security vulnerability discovered within Android, then there are at least 
three parties involved to get that vulnerability fixed and to get the fix out into the uh, onto the phones. So there is on the one side there is Google and the Open Handset Alliance. Um, then there is the OEM, and of course there's the carrier. So Google basically has to do the fix, or they get a fix from somebody, so they have to apply that fix, test it, um, roll that out, so they build a new firmware. Um, then usually the OEM has to pick up that patch, test it on its own, uh, because they are doing some heavy modifications to Android. Um, and then they have to yeah, create firmwares for all the carriers around the world. Then the carriers start to test those firmwares, whether they are still comply with their requirements. And then at the end, if you're lucky, you will get an OTA notification and you can download an update. But to be serious or to be honest, how many of you already got uh, for a pretty, yeah, pretty old device got still security updates? So the reason also why the OEMs avoid rolling out updates for older devices is because of their fast product cycle. So usually you get a new device every fix or every 12 months at least. And so they don't have the time and the resources to actually update all the systems. And they don't want to because selling a new device is much more uh, nice for them uh, than still supporting old devices. And also the carrier can still block updates when they don't comply to some yeah, requirements. And at the end, this leaves millions of devices um, with well-known vulnerabilities outside in the world. And uh, to give you an idea how this really, or how bad this really is, um, here is an Android version distribution as of beginning of March. Um, last week, Google apparently changed the metric how they yeah, determine those version distributions, so you cannot compare them uh, easily. But what you can see is that Gingerbread, which is now you know, like three years old, um, is still the leading operating or the leading version of Android on the market. So you, as a developer, cannot uh, afford to not support Gingerbread anymore with your app if you want to make any money. Honeycomb yeah, was just a small side note uh, within the Android uh, versions. And Android 4.x uh, combined um, roughly now counts as much as gingerbread. So um, it's, it is slowly improving, but just to give you an idea, when Apple rolled out the 6.1 iOS update last November, within 36 hours, 20% of the installed base upgraded their devices. So, and you can see Jelly Bean, which is more than one year old, still haven't reached that number. Another big issue are OEM extensions. Um, so OEMs like Samsung, HTC, they're usually doing heavy modifications to the Android core. And especially Samsung, has a really bad track record on that. So I think a lot of you can remember this Def Exynos Mem vulnerability. So Def Exynos Mem is a world read-writable um, device. Uh, and it basically gives you access to all the physical memory in the system. So everyone can open it, can read to it, can read from it, can write to it, and can modify anything. So we can speculate about the reasons why they did so, but um, my explanation is that they had time pressure, so they needed to come up with a solution, and they didn't come up with a proper solution. Also last year, there has been this famous USSD code vulnerability, where you uh, <clears throat> could inject USSD codes into the phone via a URL, or via a QR code, or via NFC, which lit to an immediate factory reset of your device. So you scanned the QR code and your device immediately started to shut down and doing the factory reset. You couldn't stop that. Also, HTC managed uh, in 2011 to roll out rootkits in their own OEM apps they provided within Android. So 
that's also not very good. And of course, because of the time pressure and the fast product cycles, the software quality of the device drivers, especially in Linux, is very, very bad. So I've seen a lot of code of that and it's very, very bad. Usually the OEMs do not care to get those device drivers into the mainline kernel, so they do not care about the coding standards and the proper interfaces within the Linux kernel. And um, yeah, so that's part of the, um, the problems. So what can we expect in the future? So in Jelly Bean 4.2, uh, we've seen a new, some of new features uh, to improve security. The first one is secure USB debugging. So you can whitelist ADB access um, to the device. There is a better random number generator based on OpenSSL. So randomness is very important for having good um, encryption. And you also have a feature which is uh, SMS confirmation, so no app can any longer silently send SMS without uh, confirmation from the user. And the last one um, is SE Android, which is a merger of security enhanced Linux and Android. And uh, probably we will see that in Android 5.0. Um, there are some rumors. And also, Samsung already started uh, to implement features of SE Linux within Android uh, with its Nox system, which they announced in February at the Mobile World Congress. And that brings me to the end of the talk. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think we have some time left for Q&A. Thank you, Matthias Lange.